Good morning, everyone. Today's Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord. What a wonderful day this is, the beginning of Holy Week. I want to continue my discussion with you on the meaning of the Mass. Uh, it is the center of the universe. And I think that's a good terminology to use because the Mass is the end all be all of the universe. It is God manifesting himself to us in this sacrificial gift to the Father for the forgiveness of our sins. So just a little recap from yesterday. Remember we told you about the Mass being the Passover meal of the Lord. However, Christ is the Passover. He personifies the Passover, right? Passing over from death into life. And remember we talked about the three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil night watch into Easter Sunday of the resurrection of the Lord. Those three days coming together, so to speak, as one. And so the Mass, taking into account those three events of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter night watch of the resurrection, all in one salvific moment into what we call a chirotic time you remember that word right chirotic time not temporal time remember that's suspended now here is this chirotic time an interesting word but it captures really what the mass is because we go back to the upper room the foot of the cross and the empty tomb when we enter into the mystery of the Mass. There's only one Mass. One Mass. Even though it is celebrated in temporal times every single day or a couple times each day, there's only one Mass. And mysteriously and theologically and mystically, how about that, all three of those we go back mysteriously, mystically, Theologically, we go back to the upper room, the foot of the cross, and the empty tomb. Mass, the sacrifice of Christ for our salvation. How many times did Christ die? His resurrection. All of that one captured in the celebration of Mass. So that's why I told you yesterday, when you come to Mass, you have to almost divest yourself of thoughts and other things, which is hard, I know, when you come into Mass, because you want to be centered in prayer. You come in, you genuflect before you go into your pew, the right knee, always the right knee, you genuflect to the tabernacle. To the tabernacle which the sacred host is placed after communion the real body blood soul and divinity of christ you come into your pew and you pray a prayer there's a lot of prayers for preparation for mass i don't know if you know that you could google that you know google saint thomas aquinas's prayers for the preparation of mass well you may have your own preparation prayer you know what prayer you're going to be praying as an intention because the parish has an intention for every mass don't they this mass is being offered for so and so at the request of so and so that's beautiful people want masses offered for their family soul or for an intention you know mass could be sold, uh, celebrated for a living or a deceased person right and so it's a beautiful beautiful offering that people come and say, listen, I would like to have Mass celebrated for my mother and father, or my grandma, or my grandfather. That's beautiful. Well, anyway, you make your intention, okay? When you come into church, genuflect before you go into a pew. If you cannot genuflect, you make a profound bow. In other words, a bow from the waist. To the Blessed Sacrament. That's if you can't, if your knees are not as like they used to be, right? So even our bodies, ugh, 
They don't work as they used to. So you adapt either genuflexion or a profound bow from the waist to the Blessed Sacrament. And you make your intention. You try to center yourself and say, I have to get to that upper room right now in my mind. I have to get to Calvary. I have to get to the empty tomb. I need to shut off everything. So when Mass begins, I'm there. So, vestments. I think we should talk about vestments, right? I think it's a good thing to know about vestments. The owl, the white garment, you know the white garment that the priest and deacon put on first? The altar servers wear this. Even little babies wear it on the day of their baptism. They clothe themselves with immortality. You know, it's, it's a cloth to remind us of who we are in relationship to Christ. We're a new creation. We have been clothed in Christ. So the alb, coming from the Latin word albus, which means white. And so we wear white. Remember the book of Revelation? They wore the white garments washed in the blood of the Lamb. Don't you love that? Beautiful. So, First Holy Communion. Now at this parish, thanks be to God, both the boys and the girls wear white. You know, why don't the boys wear white? Why was it? A, it's not a girl thing, is it? No. It's a theological thing. It's a scriptural thing. It's a baptismal thing. Everybody should be in white to signify they belong to Christ. They have clothed themselves in the robe of the Lamb. They have clothed themselves in Christ. And so that's why the older servers wear white. That's why the priests and deacons first put on this garment in white. That's why you clothe the baby in a white garment. That's why the first holy communicants are in white. That's why the confirmation candidates are in a white alb or a white garment. Absolutely. Hey, listen, did you notice that when you have a funeral mass, what goes on top of the casket? A white garment. Mm-hmm. Do you see the connections of all this? That's what it's all about, our dignity in Christ. So let me put on this white garment for you. Sometimes we kiss these garments because they are blessed. Now this one goes right over my head. I rolled it up in, with my two hands. Make sure I put on the right way. And then there's a zipper right on this side. And it's supposed to cover our street clothing. So is it, I don't have a mirror. Does it cover my street clothing? So it covers the street clothing. And so I'm in my baptismal garment that my mom and dad put on me on the day of my baptism. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad, for introducing me to Jesus and for clothing me in Christ when I was preparing for the, of course, the sacrament of baptism, when I really got into the church. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. Technically speaking, now, I know we don't do this, but technically speaking, the baby should be wearing other clothes for baptism. And then after the water is poured over their head, they're baptized. Then they're dressed in the garment. That's when it happens. Now, we like everything to be like ready. We're like the cooking shows. You have everything diced up first and everything ready, and then we're all ready. But technically speaking, the baby should be coming in a different outfit. I don't know, a onesie? Is that what they call them? Like a whole like onesie pajama kind of a thing, maybe blue or pink or yellow. And then, as the ceremony goes on and the actual baptism takes place, of the water over their heads with the Trinitarian formula, 
I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. After that is over, they're clothed with the white garment, with the baptismal garment. Technically, that's how it should happen, but a lot of people put it on before they're actually baptized. So maybe just a little thought, maybe you could tell other people like, hey, listen, why don't you dress little Joey or little Susie in regular clothes when you come to church? And then you have the beautiful baptismal garment after the actual baptism. Because visually you see now they have become a new creation in Christ. Beautiful. So, when we enter into the church building, what do we do first? We dip our right hand in holy water and we bless ourselves, reminding us of what? Our baptism. I am in full relationship with Jesus Christ because of my, my baptism. And I'm reminded of that every time when I place my hand in that holy water font and I bless myself. I place the cross of Christ over me. That's to whom I belong. If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. So symbolically, what do we do? We remind ourselves of our baptism. We place the cross over our bodies because we're Christians, right? Unless you, unless you deny yourself and pick up your cross, you cannot be my follower. And we follow him. We enter into the church building and we recollect ourselves for the celebration of Holy Mass. I think that's a great reminder for all of us. And now we go along, I'll be telling you a little bit about, more and more about that. But I just wanna do a little commercial right now before I end, you know why? Because today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. You know why it's called that? Of course, because they were, of course, laying palm branches before him. And also their cloaks. They did that too. Palm branches. Because in, in Jerusalem, you know, palm branches are all around. You just like, whoop, and throw it down. And then their cloaks, they would lay before him. And I was telling you at Mass today, the, the road is really not wide it's kind of like narrow because I was on that road and it's hilly I mean you have to have your weedies when you do that walk because it's not you know it's not flat so you know you're going into Jerusalem and they're they're singing Hosanna to the son of David and if you listen to the homily today what kind of Messiah do they want that's a very interesting question because all of that was in turmoil. You know, all of what? Well, that time. Political turmoil. Political unrest. Was a Messiah, was, do they want a, a Messiah to handle all that? Well, he does, but he does it in the way of a, of a, whole, a whole new way of life. So our Messiah should definitely help us to dictate how we are to live our life. So even though you and I don't talk politics in church, I think we have to realize that Christ is very specific with his gospel. And our way of life does filter out into the world, right? Helping us to make good choices put people in places of leadership that really help promote the gospel of Christ. I've always said the voting booth is a sacred place. It's a holy place because you have to form your conscience. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you to make the right decision based on gospel values. So it does filter out into society, but Jesus is not 
a political person or a messiah to take care of their political problems. He is the king of the world, not the king of a state or sovereignty. Do you know what I mean? He's a different type of king that oversees everything. But it's a way of life the gospel calls us to. So they were holding palm branches, and a lot of people used to hold palm branches during a revolt. I don't know if you know that. They would hold palm branches during a revolt, like, oh, get this guy in here, come on! And they would put him on a donkey because of royalty. But that's not what Christ was about. That was not what he was about, that earthly sense. Remember the, the donkey and the, the ox in the crib? The heavenly or the clean and the unclean? It, it was an earthly and a heavenly. He was not about earthly things. He was about the heavenly thing, the heavenly realm. So I just wanted to give you a little like side commercial for Palm Sunday as we continue our explanation of the Mass. And then tomorrow I'll conclude by continually investing myself and explaining more things. Have a blessed Palm Sunday, everybody. God bless you.